Welcome everyone. I'm Eve Samples. I'm executive director of Friends of the Everglades. This is a clean water conversation and we have some really fascinating guests here today to talk about the health threat of toxic algae, in particular blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, and what we can do to address it, as well as what our region, the greater Everglades region of Florida, has been through. So Thank you to everyone watching live on YouTube and Facebook. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our guests who I'm going to introduce to you momentarily. Before I do, I just want to say uh, Clean Water Conversations are a program of Friends of the Everglades, and we offer them free as an educational tool and resource. And if you're interested in supporting them, please go to everglades.org and learn more about that. So without further ado, I'd, I'd like to first introduce uh, Dr. Paul Allen Cox. He's executive director of Brain Chemistry Labs in Jackson, Wyoming. He and his team have done groundbreaking research on the topic we're discussing today, particularly toxic substances produced by cyanobacteria. His work and his team's work has really helped us understand the link between cyanobacteria and ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. Their work was memorialized in the film Toxic Puzzle that we're going to allude to today and features prominent exploration of South Florida, including Stewart, where our next guest is sitting. So welcome, Dr. Cox. Thank you. Our second guest is Rob Lord. Rob Lord joined Martin Health System in 1998, and he currently serves as the president of Cleveland Clinic Martin Health. He's a member of the Florida Bar and board certified by the Florida Bar and Health Law. He's also a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives. And I think perhaps most importantly to this conversation today, Rob is a longtime Stewart resident and really a um, a student and a devotee of the outdoors. So we're eager to talk to you today, Rob. Welcome. Thank you so much. So I want to start by orienting our audience to some of what we've been through in, in the greater Everglades region in terms of toxic algae, particularly in the last several years, 2016 and 2018. Forgive me if this gives anyone PTSD because it really was traumatic for those of us who lived through it. But I think it's important to revisit, especially this time of year when our water is actually looking decent at the moment. So this is one of the pictures that, that will prompt um, those feelings. This was 2018, an aerial view of toxic blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, pushed up against Lake Okeechobee at the gate uh, at Port Mayaka, where Lake Okeechobee enters the St. Lucie Canal, which flows into the St. Lucie River. So you can really visibly see this stuff move at Lake Okeechobee. This image is at the uh, St. Lucie Locks and anyone in the Stewart region who was around in 2018 or 2016 uh, will recall this. this neon green, some folks called it guacamole green, blue-green algae, cyanobacteria that tend to clump and form mats and was extremely noxious and um, is not normal. It shouldn't be happening this way. So these photos are going to orient our discussion so we can talk about what risks uh, we all faced being near it, Floridians faced, and what uh, therapies, treatments, uh, possible solutions we have. And, and here's another aerial view also from the St. Lucie River. You know, this stuff was really concerning because the toxins in these blooms exceeded EPA and World Health Organization limits by many, many times. They also were confirmed to have been aerosolized and traveled through the air. So you didn't have to be someone with a, a yacht um, to be exposed to it or any kind of boat. Um, it, it was traveled in the air and that was confirmed through testing of people's nasal passages. Yet people were still boating, recreating. There's a really striking image I've seen of someone jet skiing in this green water. And this happened mainly in the St. Lucie Estuary in Stewart, the Stewart region, and also on the West Coast, the Caloosahatchee Estuary in the Fort Myers, uh, Lee County area. And this image is actually of a fish kill pertaining to red tide that unfortunately coincided with toxic blue-green algae blooms in 2018 on the West Coast. So um, sorry to bombard you with those images at lunchtime uh, for those of you who are eating and watching this, but we do want to refresh your memories about the, the really severe nature of this threat. So 
We're going to talk a bit about a toxic puzzle, which was a 2018 documentary that features Dr. Cox prominently, and it illuminated the rise in ALS cases in many countries and scientists' suspicion that a substance in the environment is the culprit, specifically BMAA, which is produced by blue-green algae, cyanobacteria is the other name for that. Um, and just a quick refresher, blue-green algae is fed by human pollution and warming water temperatures also tend to contribute to it. Toxic puzzle really drove home the point um, that many Floridians have witnessed uh, that these things are increasing in size and frequency and human health is inextricably linked to the health of our environment. So with, with that um, said, I'd like to turn it to you, Dr. Cox, to talk a bit about how the toxic algae crisis in Florida in particular first came to your attention. Well, uh, <clears throat> here at the Brain Chemistry Labs in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, we're a not-for-profit organization. Our sole mission is to help uh, improve patient outcomes from people who have very serious neurodegenerative diseases uh, and prevent them if possible. Uh, we began our studies in Guam where we found that Chamorro villagers who had a puzzling paralytic disease were uh, receiving uh, a, a lot of uh, toxins from cyanobacteria that contaminated their there were their, their traditional foodstuffs. We've uh, later moved on to uh, studies in St. Kitts on the vervet population there, confirming those earlier studies, and we're now in FDA-approved clinical trials. So our major focus is to, um, as a not-for-profit organization, is to be really focused on improving the health of people and protecting people from these toxins. Um, <clears throat> my first introduction to the uh, toxic cyanobacterial blooms in uh, Florida really came through a news report in 2016. Uh, I saw on television uh, a report that there was a uh, cyanobacterial incident there. I'd been working uh, really around the world in the Great Lakes, in um, Sweden, uh, the Baltic, I'd, um, but suddenly here it was right in the United States. And uh, so I jumped on the plane I uh, told uh, Bo Landin, the uh, Swedish film director, what I was doing. He flew down uh, with cameras, and uh, I began to sample uh, the St. Lucie River from uh, Lake Okeechobee down. What had happened was there had been a very high amount of rainfall, and I think the Army Corps of Engineers, fearing that the dike could be dangerously uh, breached, um, <clears throat> released this cyanobacterial-laden and nutrient-laden water down the St. Lucie River. And what concerned me most, although uh, Martin County seemed to be really have their act together, there were signs uh, around Stewart, uh, you know, uh, in the state parks alerting people, this is dangerous, be careful. Um, up around Lake Okeechobee, I saw a lot of local people picnicking, their children swimming, fishing, and there didn't seem to be any sort of uh, public warning of the people of what could be happening. I think the thing that concerned us the most, we were interested in seeing if this toxin we've been studying, BMAA, which may be linked to neurodegenerative disease, was, was there in abundance. It turned out, fortunately, uh, that it was not really uh, high levels. Uh, BMAA is usually produced uh, as cyanobacterial blooms are dying in uh, uh, regions of nutrient de deprivation, particularly nitrogen. But when we uh, looked at the microcystin levels, uh, this really alarmed us because uh, microcystin is a uh, trigger for uh, primary liver cancer. And we found that the levels in the St. Lucie River exceeded World Health Organization standards uh, 2,000 fold. So uh, we uh, were very alarmed. And that began uh, our efforts to monitor both the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie River for releases. There was a subsequent um, release in 2018 that produced these, uh, again, the sort of very viscous cyanobacterial blooms. And um, we, we've been monitoring very carefully the health situation in Florida. As a not-for-profit based in Wyoming, we're very immune or relatively immune to any political pressures from Florida. We don't take government money or anything like that. Uh, we're just here to provide uh, good information for Floridians, for the residents of Florida too, so they can protect themselves. 
Thank you for that. I'm glad you mentioned Lake Okeechobee and also alluded to the political pressures. It, it is really important to understand both of those and, and they are related. So Lake Okeechobee has been managed as something as a re reservoir for the massive agricultural fields south of the lake and held artificially high in the dry months for decades upon decades. So that when we get to the rainy season and the lake itself is at risk of a, a breach of its dike, the Army Corps of Engineers sends the water east and west to the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee. The St. Lucie River never needs Lake Okeechobee water. Even if that water was pristine, it wouldn't need it because it doesn't need the fresh water. It's, it's a brackish estuary. It's not a natural connection. Caloosahatchee needs a little certain times of the year, never needs it when there's toxic algae. So this really demands um, policy changes that that do touch on politics. And, and I'm sure exploring these connections um, is somewhat politically fraught for researchers like you and, and advocates like me. So um, it's we feel it's really important to, to speak out uh, about it. And, and that's why we're here today. So thank you for that. If I might mention, uh, one of the things that concerned us the most was we had received permission to study uh, brain samples from dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon that had been beached. And when we found uh, in those dolphins high levels of BMA in their brains and Alzheimer's neuropathology, that really worried us. And uh, we were coming to the, uh, uh, this was work we did with the uh, University of Miami Neurology Department, Dr. David Davis. And we're convinced that these dolphins may represent a very good sort of canary in the cage. They're an indicator of uh, ecological dysfunction. And we uh, published that paper. We've got another one now that we've submitted. Um, we're really worried about this. And our real concern now is that citizens in Florida may unwittingly be exposed to toxic compounds that can impair their health. Thank you for explaining that um, and thank you for your work. So, so Rob, I want to turn it to you now as, as the head of a health system in Stewart, which was arguably ground zero in 2016 for these blooms and, and one of two really bad areas in 2018. You really had an up close view of the, these toxic algae blooms we're talking about. So what, can you talk in general terms about what local healthcare providers saw in their exam rooms as a result? Well, yeah, see, when, when this first uh, arose, we, we noticed we were seeing increased instances of patients presenting um, with a variety of, of symptoms, um, uh, rashes, uh, gastrointestinal issues, a lot of respiratory problems, uh, eye irritation, among others. Um, with this common ground that they'd been on or in or around the, the river where these blooms were occurring. Um, and in some severe, more severe cases, the uh, patients presented to our emergency rooms. And uh, uh, it, it reached a point where um, not long before, the, you know, th this happened, um, uh, we dealt with other tropical illnesses where we, uh, you know, we were having to uh, focus on, on that. Here, what we did is we literally posted signs in our four emergency rooms here locally that said, have you been in contact with the river? Um, uh, you know, we, we were asking all questions, uh, all patients who presented to physician offices or to our emergency room uh, uh, questions related to uh, their contact with the river or, or being in or around it. Um, so so uh, and, and at the time uh, it was before we, we merged as, uh, into the Cleveland Clinic uh, and, and we are now an organization that uh, takes great pride in, in, uh, in being a part of uh, uh, national, international research uh, in, in, in all fields of medicine. Um, at the time, I, I was quoted and, and uh, I spoke at, a, uh, at an event that was related to this to local government entities where I was encouraging that we study it further and that we, we look at this. And when I was asked what we were doing, what we did is we treated those patients and tried to get them home. Uh, the phrase I used, we treat and we street them. Um, and so we were not in the business at that point of, of conducting uh, uh, academic research in the subject, but, but we, were, uh, we were trying to figure out what we could do to best take care of these patients. Um, uh, we saw fairly significant numbers of people who indicated that uh, uh, they, uh, uh, 
you know, they, they, that was the one thing that they, they had come in contact with that might cause this, and they had no prior history. Um, what it led us to conclude was um, this is something that needs the study. I, I'm, I'm so thankful to have uh, Dr. Cox and, and people like him uh, who, who are really focused uh, on, on researching uh, this issue. Um, uh, I'm sure our organization would like to be of assistance in that as well. The Cleveland Clinic is very proud of its history uh, in this, and we, we, we try to cure uh, illnesses and diseases. But, th but that's, you know, basically, you know, what we saw was a, uh, a dramatic increase in people, again, gastrointestinal problems, respiratory problems, eye irritation, um, and, and in the frail elderly population, sometimes those, those complications uh, appeared serious. The other things that Dr. Cox uh, spoke of are great concerns. Quite often it takes years for them to manifest themselves. But uh, what we don't know right now is what's coming down the pike as a result of what happened in 2016 and 2018. And that concerns me greatly. That's an excellent point. Uh, the long-term effects are really the most concerning and what could keep you up at night and I find it notable also that, um, so Cleveland Clinic obviously is based in Ohio and Ohio has been impacted by toxic algae extensively. The Toledo area has had its water supply threatened by this issue. So certainly not just a Florida problem, but we've really seen it acutely in Florida. And I think it's attracted more attention in Florida in some ways because of our tourism economy. And when our beautiful beaches are closed as they were in, in 2016 uh, due to red tide, um, and our waterways were closed due to the cyanobacteria blooms, uh, it's severely damaging to, to our economy and, and potentially our health, as you're saying. I just want to remind folks who are watching that you can submit comments. We are going to have a Q&A period at the end, com uh, questions or comments for Dr. Cox or Rob, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, so Dr. Cox, uh, Rob talked a bit about your research and, and his appreciation of it, and we certainly share that view. So Toxic Puzzle premiered in 2017. We had a terrible year in 2018, which I guess was beneficial for your research because it allowed you and your team to return here and, and learn more. So what, what more do we know now specifically about the causal relationship between these toxins and some of the long-term health issues we're concerned about, neurodegenerative diseases and, and liver disease that you talked about. Uh, thanks, Eve. I, I think people need to understand that this research is developing. In other words, it's sort of like we stumbled on something that we're trying to understand. There's a lot of questions that are unanswered that I think uh, Rob referred to, particularly long-term consequences. The science showing that microcystin, which is a toxin produced by cyanobacteria that we found in the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee, uh, that's very solid. Uh, there's no question that microcystin triggers primary liver cancer. And based on our 2016 analyses of the St. Lucie River and Stewart area, we predicted uh, that within 20 years, there'll be an increase of primary liver cancer uh, along that, uh, people that were exposed along that waterway. Uh, BMAA is a different issue. Uh, we, we have a very strong case that it triggers this ALS, Alzheimer's type disease among the Chamorro villagers of Guam. We've replicated that in non-human primates in uh, St. Uh, uh, Kitts. I found the same thing. Uh, uh, our colleagues at Dartmouth Medical School have shown uh, that there's increase, uh, about a 25-fold increase in ALS for people who live next to cyanobacterially contaminated lakes. Dr. Larry Brand at the Grosenthal School of Oceanography has shown that shellfish, bottom-dwelling fish absorb this. So if you eat the fish in these polluted areas. Um, but what we really haven't proven yet, and I think I want to be really clear on this, we haven't proven that BMA causes Alzheimer's in human beings. But we do have strong proof of it among the Chamorro villagers, among non-human primates, and now in dolphins. So... The fear here is and exactly what Rob said. These, these are processes that may take 10 to 20 years to develop. And I think for me, Eve, the tragedy is, is and again, mind you, I'm from Wyoming, okay? So I think you have to sort of disregard my comments about Florida or at least take them with a grain of salt. But it seems to me that this is a preventable exposure. In other words, why should people living along the St. Lucie River and Stewart or Caloosahatchee 
have to suddenly have this big uh, release of cyanobacteria plaguing them. Uh, because uh, uh, as far as we can determine all of that, and I mean 100% of that, came from the release from Lake Okeechobee. So it seems to me the simple way to stop this is to stop those releases of cyanobacterially contaminated water. And we've uh, 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 submitted comments to the Corps of Engineers asking them if they basically saying, you need to be aware of health consequences before you make these releases. Obviously, we don't want people having a flood. I mean, there was some terrible incidents, you know, uh, almost 100 years ago, people dying in floods from the breach of the dike. But that seems to me there could be a better way of monitoring Lake Okeechobee and its toxic loads so these releases do not suddenly occur without warning. The other thing we noticed, and I compared this to uh, Fukushima, I was one of the early responders to uh, Fukushima uh, in 2011, the uh, breaching of the nuclear power plant in Japan. At all times, I had on my uh, hip a, 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 a dosimeter, a radiation device. Um, there's no devices that citizens have in Florida to see what their toxic exposures are. And, and we were disappointed, frankly, with the information that was coming to people from the government. And so we think, again, better information, stopping these releases. Uh, there's, there's some very simple things that could protect people's health that we think maybe should be considered. I want to zoom in on two of the important points you made. Number one, the Lake Okeechobee management issue, and number two, communication from public health officials. So on the first front, the Army Corps of Engineers right now is reworking its Lake Okeechobee management plan. This is a once in a decade process. Uh, the new one is called LOSUM. There's a lot of terrible acronyms in this world. The Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual. And this is a really important time for people to weigh in on it. And, and at everglades.org, you can find out more information about how, because for really the first time, the Army Corps and other water managers are seriously considering the public health threat of toxic algae and how they configure this new lake plan. And we're very hopeful and pressing for a halt to those St. Lucie River discharges. Um, you know, will we get to zero? We'll see, but we're certainly gonna be pushing for it. And, and there is a way to achieve it that will not threaten the integrity of, of the dike around the lake and the people who live south of it. And that way is by lowering the lake faster during the dry season. We've been weighing the benefits of water supply for large industrial farms so much heavier than protecting human beings from health risks. So that, that equation needs to change. And, and the core is at least demonstrating more flexible thinking on that now and talking about it. Even um, if I could just add there, uh, I have a lot of respect for the technical department of the Corps of Engineers. These are really smart people. Yes. And so I think particularly the 2016 release was inadvertent. They didn't understand what was happening. Um, but now there's been citizen input. I think the Corps is in a very good position to sort of exercise leadership in monitoring those toxins and, and in controlling the releases so we don't have that sort of stuff coming down the St. Lucie River. So, frankly, I'm quite... Uh, I'm quite optimistic, Eve, that there's going to be some good things coming out of this. And I think people in Florida need to realize this is not an unsolvable problem. It involves being more careful about clean water, preventing agricultural runoff uh, going into the rivers and waterways, and particularly Lake Okeechobee. But I really think uh, the sort of collaborative process I see emerging now in Florida gives me a lot of hope. So I hope that people watching our discussion here won't walk away with sort of a desperate feeling, quite the opposite. I'm, I, and I think that uh, uh, your team, and, and particularly having Rob Lord and his team together, this is a collaborative process that I think will really help. It's it, 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 can I jump in just for a second? Um, to, to your point on the importance of this once in a decade process, one of the things I learned as I went through this, um, uh, to Dr. Cox's point, the people of the Army Corps are intelligent people. They're, they're thoughtful people. They're, it is it is the Army Corps. Let's remember the word Army. Um, that they they are given a a, a plan, uh, and their job is to execute that plan. And they will go forward and execute that plan um, with probably uh, what I gathered was limited flexibility in terms of how that goes from their point of view. That makes this process we're going through in through my eyes, as I understand it critically important for how they manage this resource during the next decade. So I encourage everybody to get involved. 
Thanks, Rob. The, the other point I wanted to zoom in on was about the lack of communication and transparency, particularly from the Florida Department of Health back in 2018. There was a really insightful and alarming investigative report out of Fort Myers, the news press, um, as a result of a, a public records request that looked at the Department of Health emails at that time. And you, you see an agency much more concerned about its public image than responding to citizen concerns about they, whether they can go near the water, go in the water, and, and a lack of signage as well. So I, I do believe the Department of Health has become more responsive since then. I don't think it's exactly where it needs to be. So that's something we're going to continue to talk about um, so I'd like to turn it to you now, Rob, to, to you know, hear a little bit about your personal experience. You grew up in Seward, you fish these waterways, you're an outdoorsman. How did seeing this play out in your backyard affect you personally? Well, let, let me start with it literally played out in my backyard. I, I live on the South Fork of the St. Lucie River and um, uh, on a, on a personal level, um, the, the, some of the greatest joy I've experienced in my life uh, is the time that I've spent on local waterways uh, with my father and my brother and my grandfather and my uncles and my daughters who are, are avid, both avid fishermen and, and to watch this play out this way. Um, uh, to watch, uh, to, to, to know there's not a blade of seagrass in, this, in the South Fork of the St. Lucie River for miles from, from our house is, is, uh, is heartbreaking, uh, literally to me. Um, uh, this area is, is truly blessed uh, to have one of the most remarkable, uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, biological systems that exists anywhere in, in the world. And, um, and the damage that is being done to that is, is, is heartbreaking to me. Now, back when we had the, the, uh, the horrific blooms, um, uh, we, we decided as an organization to, to publicly take a stand. Um, but candidly, I felt like um, we weren't getting as much traction as I would like to see as we were talking about those environmental concerns. But because of the things we talked about a few minutes ago, uh, the, the, the problems uh, that were immediate on human health. These long-term consequences, we don't know. Although I, I, I would respectfully suggest to everybody, I can't tell you whether there's a causal relationship. Dr. Cox can't tell you whether there's a causal relationship with some of these. But what I can guess uh, with a 99% per, confidence is whatever it is, it's not good. What's going to come out of this is not good. And we just don't know how bad it's going to be. Um, and so we, it became a public health issue or we tried not tried to make it. It was a public health issue. We just tried to give it visibility. And um, and that seemed to get some more traction. Um, uh, and, and so that's been uh, sort of been been the focus. But on a personal level, um, you know, I don't eat fish out of that river. I still catch them, but I don't eat them. Um, uh, and, and that's fine. I take pictures and let them go quick. But beyond that, it's just. Um, it's it's very very sad to see something like this happen in the community. As, as you alluded to, Eve, I've been, lived here a long time. I my family moved here in 1969, so I'm working on my 52nd year in this community. And within a week of moving here, I I discovered a fish called a snook. I was a bass fisherman up to that point, and then I instantly realized that I had something even more fun to chase. And so that's been a big part of my life. Martin Health System back in. in 2016, right, um, was really vocal uh, about this issue. And, and I think so many people in the community appreciated that. It really felt like you were standing up for us. Was that hard to do? There were. Uh, I, we talked about the politics of this. Um, I, I was subjected to some criticism. Uh, there were there were people that uh, locally who, who make their living off of tourism who felt like um, uh, us being as public as we were was a negative thing. Um, uh, obviously, people that uh, live in, uh, and earn their living in some of those agricultural areas uh, uh, viewed us as, as, as being antagonistic or the enemy. I, I regret that. I wish that wasn't the case. Um, 
and and I'll be very frank with with everybody. Uh, anytime um, a member of the business community uh, uh, questioned what we were doing, I pointed out to them that you can you can see what's happening in our community. Just watch your favorite news channel. I don't care if you watch CNN or or uh, Fox News or, or, or whatever political persuasion one might be. It was on. It was it was a national news story. So there was no secret. Let's just let's call it what it is and be honest. And and uh, you know, I, I'm not inclined to stick my head in the sand and ignore problems. Um, and I, I think that's the approach we, we have to take. But but I, uh, there was a good bit of criticism. And um, and that comes with territory. I, that, that didn't bother me at all. Thank you for, for speaking up and, and explaining that now. So calling it like it is, you just mentioned, Rob, um, I think Dr. Cox did just that when he called what happened in Southwest Florida in 2018, Florida's Fukushima, as he alluded to earlier, and, and it did get heightened attention. Governor Ron DeSantis took office in early 2019, probably created a blue-green algae task force. Um, however, the nutrient pollution that fuels these blooms and, and the lake management plan as it stands today has not changed. So the lake's high right now. It's about two feet higher than it was a year ago this time. If it's still this high June 1st, we may have a very bad summer. There's a, a decent chance of toxic algae blooms. So Dr. Cox, my question's for you. What do you think it will take to significantly change public policy? I, you know, I, what can I say? When I, when I came into uh, St. Lucie River to uh, what the local people were calling guacamole because of the viscosity that blooms. Uh, I came as a scientist and I have to tell you, I'm very politically naive. I mean, where we live in Wyoming, uh, traffic jam is if you look down the road to the left in Spring Gulch and there's a pickup truck in the distance, okay? So uh, very unsophisticated. Uh, so I, you know, I had to go back to try and understand. What I didn't understand is why information was not forthcoming to the citizens who were affected. When we were sampling Lake Okeechobee, a number of moms came up to me. I'm dressed in hazmat gear. We're taking extraordinary precautions to keep me and my colleagues safe. And uh, they're saying, why are you wearing that stuff? And these are the same people have their kids out there. I'm saying, no, no, this is very dangerous. They said, well, they didn't know. So it seems to me the first level is to get accurate information to citizens when there is a cyanobacterial problem so that people can make their own decisions. They know it's dangerous and they might decide not to go water skiing that day or do something different. And that to me seems to be a, 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 a really solid thing that, and positive thing that government can do. Secondly, I am enheartened by what I see as a very bipartisan approach to this in Florida. Uh, I mean, this affects everybody. This is not a political issue. And the fact that the Corps of Engineers are in a position to make a positive impact to me is really a good thing. I mean, uh, the thing I'm worried about, and Rob Lord alluded to this, I mean, as scientists, we have to be careful and stick to our data. But uh, Rob, I really liked what you said. The issue is not, is this dangerous? The issue is, how dangerous is it? We're really concerned about this. And in Japan, during the Fukushima incident, the Japanese government was not getting out information. People did not know if it was dangerous or not. I'm down there as a scientist carrying a radiation dosimeter other people didn't have access to that information. Um, but I'm encouraged. I think the core can play a really positive role here. There must be a way, Eve, that they can stage releases of Okeechobee water before they have to release cyanobacterially laden waters. And I think they're smart and they'll figure out a way to do this. I've been impressed with what I'm hearing from all sides of the political spectrum in Florida. So this is a problem that can be cured. But for the long term, Eve, you alluded perfectly to it. We need in Florida to make sure that people are very careful about releasing agricultural effluents that are nutrient rich. I mean, cyanobacteria are the oldest organisms on this planet. And if we create what this world was like three billion years ago, uh, high nutrients, warm, uh, you know, you, you're creating heaven for cyanobacteria. Um, I really think that enforcing current Clean Water Acts uh, will really help a lot. Uh, the problem, of course, Rob, is not just in, uh, as you alluded to, not just in the Stewart area. I mean, we're working with Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Eric Pioro, up in Ohio uh, on Lake Erie. Um, but I'm very worried also about uh, southwest Florida, where people are sandwiched 
between cyanobacterial blooms coming down the Clusahatchee and red tides from offshore. It's sort of a toxic vice. You know, I used to watch that movie Miami Vice. You know, well, this is a toxic vice, the poor people down there. And there's a lot of physician and citizen concern as well down in Port Charlotte, uh, clear down to Naples, uh, Boca Grande. And I think as citizens make their views heard and their concerns, I think government will, will respond in a positive way. At least that's my hope. Thanks for that. And I'm glad you brought up red tide. 45 nautical miles of the Gulf Coast uh, was impacted by red tide uh, about a week ago. I, it's still significant. And, and I want to circle back to that um, with you, Dr. Cox. But before we, we move on from the question of public policy and public health, I want to ask Rob about this as well. So I mentioned before that in 2018, the Florida Department of Health wasn't particularly responsive to resident concerns and emails and calls. And now we have the added burden of a global pandemic, COVID-19, which has strained our already uh, depleted public health resources in Florida and across the country. I think um, there's some general consensus that public health has not been adequately funded for many years. So how can public health leaders and, and leaders across Florida, including in healthcare, help us prepare for the distinct possibility of another toxic algae bloom? Well, first, let me say this. We, on a local level, we have very strong relationships uh, with the county health departments in Martin County and St. Lucie County. Um, uh, perhaps an irony in the current situation is that uh, COVID has uh, caused us to really lock arms and, and, and work as a single team. Uh, one of the things I'm fond of saying is uh, there I use too many sports metaphors, perhaps, but there's only one jersey in the COVID battle. Um, there's only one team. We, we can't afford to, to be divided. And so we've had a, a great deal of fortune there. Um, uh, the, 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 but how, how can, you know, the, the um, first transparency is critical. You, you have to have information. Um, and um, and so hopefully the Florida Department of Health will continue to do that. I know that, that the burden that has been placed on uh, the, the public health system in Florida is tremendous. Uh, you alluded to the fact that many believe uh, that it has been underfunded. Um, I am one of those. I, I, I've watched that evolve over the last uh, several decades. And, um, and then we get hit by a pandemic and, and, and we, we pay the price. Uh, for the dismantling of the public health system. So I'd encourage us as a country to, uh, to, to, to take a second look at that and, and, and beef that up. Uh, but otherwise, we, we, we need to make our voices heard our, and be concerned, try and come to the table with constructive um, uh, solutions and be a constructive part of the problem. I think, you know, the, the approach I hear Dr. Cox taking to me is the right approach. It's, it's working collaboratively uh, with them. Um, you know, there's no question uh, in my mind that uh, uh, research is, is critical here. Um, that we, we need to be uh, doing the, the work that Dr. Cox is doing, and we need to be financially supporting that and funding that through uh, the, the mechanisms, grants, what have you, that exist for that. And um, uh, obviously, uh, the, the, the health department needs to focus on preventative measures and educating the public on when these things happen, uh, you know, if we do run into it, how, how we avoid being injured by it. Uh, but the best preventative measure is for it to not happen at all. And, um, and, and that needs to be the focus of our state, uh, of the Army Corps. Um, and, and for those of us who are inclined to do so, uh, we need to be strong advocates for that. Um, I would encourage us all to do that in a constructive way. Um, you know, I have witnessed some things happen uh, locally when, when that was going on, where the interactions with uh, the, the government officials were hostile. Um, and, and I understand that. I understand the emotions that led to that. But I don't know that it's particularly productive. Um, uh, and I think we, we did have a lot of success with respectful communication, but, but firm and, and um, uh, committed knowing that uh, we're not going to, to uh, vary from, from the principles that, that, that underlie this, which for me is, uh, is public health. We, 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 it is our job, it is my job uh, to be a strong advocate for public health, but I, I would encourage every citizen to take that on as their own responsibility and uh, to reach out, let them know this is an important issue. And for politicians, um, 
uh, you know, I, I'm not a single issue voter, but this is a really important issue for me. And um, and if you're and, and if you're not pretty close to me on alignment on that, then it doesn't really matter what your other issues are. This is a in, in our local political arena. This is the single most important issue in my mind. That's helpful. Dr. Cox said earlier, this isn't a political issue. And, and I agree. It's not in the sense of two party politics. Um, However, it's political in the sense that for so many years in Florida, we lacked political will to address it. And, and that has changed since 2018. And how could it not? I mean, any politician with his wits or her wits uh, would recognize this is a really smart thing to address because it appeals to everyone to try to fix it. Um, we're not completely there yet as we're talking about, but the awareness has grown so much and so many residents have educated themselves. That's that's why we do these clean water conversations every month. People have a hunger to learn more. Number one, to protect themselves and their family, um, but also I think to be part of the solution. So we, we mentioned red tide earlier and what's happening in Southwest Florida right now. We hope to have another clean water conversation just on red tide, but I wanna make sure to ask you about this directly, Dr. Cox, because one of the researchers at Brain Chemistry Lab, uh, James Metcalf, who joined us last April for one of these chats, he uh, was the lead author on a paper that alluded to the concerns about red tide toxins and blue-green algae toxins commingling in Southwest Florida and how little we know about those impacts. What, what's your thinking about that and what needs to be done? I think that's a really uh, key issue that Dr. Metcalf has come up with. He, we uh, hired Dr. Metcalf from Scotland. He wouldn't say this because he's a very humble, self-effacing guy, but he is the world's top authority on cyanobacterial toxins. In fact, he's so good that for many years he had to keep the British government notified of his location at all times. Um, so the, the concern is this. Our tests as scientists, we look at a single toxin. For example, with the vervets in St. Kitts, not in St. Kitts, we found that BMAA triggers amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, the neuropathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease in their brains. And in a paper we just released again with our colleagues at the Miami Brain Bank, uh, we found it produces the early neuropathology of ALS. But that's just one toxin. And what happened in Port Charlotte in 2018 is horrifying to us because we found evidence that citizens down there in the sort of washout of the St. Lucie River were being hammered by brevitoxins from the red tides to the, to the C word, and these weird cyanobacterial toxins, uh, particularly microcystin, BMA, some other really terrible things, all at the same time. And we don't have enough science to know what happens when you get hammered by multiple toxins all at once. We do not understand or and cannot predict the health consequences of that. But I really, Rob Lord, want to sort of engrave in our laboratory a plaque which quotes you because you said something really important. You said, we're not exactly sure what it's going to do, but it can't be good, okay? And what we do know is that BMA, for example, does potentiate neurotoxicity of methylmercury. That's been done by researchers at Marquette University. We don't think this is a good situation. We also are studying the idea that nutrient loads coming down the St. Lucie, excuse me, coming down the Caloosahatchee, may in fact drive and perpetuate the red tides. They were there for a long time, but we find strong evidence that their duration and their extent is increasing. So again, the poor people down there need information first and foremost so they can protect themselves. Here in Wyoming, in, in, in the Tetons, we have avalanches. You know, I mean, it's a very sad thing, but every year skiers die due to avalanches. We have a great information system that says, hey, it's high avalanche danger today best that you not go skiing uh, out in the woods. And everybody respects that. And I think the same sort of rapid alert that could come down, hey, it's going to be a cyanobacterial day. Maybe this isn't a day that you should go fishing or bathing or water skiing. I think that information would be my, my, my first goal really would be that. Second, I, again, Rob, I share your confidence in the Army Corps of Engineers. They're just doing, doing what they're told to do. And citizens can get involved in this. And third is we're looking very hard at ways to prevent this pharmaceutically. 
and we're in some clinical trials at Dartmouth Medical School. We're starting a new trial in Houston. Uh, Eve, if people want to find out more about this, they could download the film Toxic Puzzle from Amazon. Uh, I think that we, it's not our film. It's a, a Swedish crew. Uh, ToxicPuzzle.com, I think, has it. Um, but I think it really behooves citizens, particularly moms and dads, to find out why cyanobacterial toxins are dangerous. As Rob said, we, we're not sure exactly how dangerous, but it can't be good. And we think people, the best thing to do is just stay away from them. Do not get exposed to cyanobacterial toxins. And then, Rob, I also really liked what you said about everybody doing their part to help clean the waterways so we don't have uh, agriculture runoffs into Okeechobee or other Florida waterways. And these, we know, drive cyanobacterial blooms. The other thing, even I just have to say this and forgive me, but I am convinced by the work of Dr. Larry Brand at the uh, – Rosenthal School of Oceanography in Miami, that restarting the Everglades would be a very good idea. I mean, the Everglades worked as a tremendous filter, ecological filter. And I think any effort that is made to restore the Everglades to its original situation will have a, 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 an increase in public health outcomes. So, Rob, uh, I, the other thing I want to just say, and forgive me for fawning over you, Rob, but having you run a major medical institution there and to speak so forcefully about uh, human health consequences is, is really you know, it's thrilling to my heart. And, and I'm finding the same thing over on the West Coast in Port Charlotte, in Naples. It's the medical community who are really exercising leadership now in getting this problem uh, 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 fixed. So thank you, Rob, and thank you, Eve, for having this. Thank you. As you might imagine, we at Friends of the Everglades share your views on the Everglades itself, and our, our founder, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, wrote of the River of Grass, and we've advocated for restoring as much of the natural system as we can. Unfortunately, Florida has been engineered and re-engineered, and, and our Everglades restoration projects are massive engineering, dirt-moving projects. Um, that, that usually aim a little too low. So we continue to advocate for that. Um, all right, so I would like to open it up to our audience now to ask questions of Rob Lord and Dr. Paul Cox. If you have questions about cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, and the health impacts, please um, add them to the chat. Allie Preston, who's our director behind the scenes here, is going to pull some of them in and we'll get to as many of them as we can. And, while, while we're um, waiting for those, I want to mention uh, something about red tide that I heard recently that really stuck with me because there, there was a, a, I think a, a myth uh, propagated by some leaders in Florida that this is naturally occurring and we can't do anything about it, but we have learned it's fueled by man-made pollutants. And the, the analogy that was really striking that I, I heard quoted recently was, uh, Red tide's like a stray animal. If you feed it, it'll stick around. And we're feeding it in Florida, unfortunately. And too many of Florida's pollution rules are bound by voluntary enforcement. So we've got to work on that. Okay, we do have a question here from Joe Neeson. Her question is, do we know how the airborne nature of this affects how far, far from the source of water we can be affected? Um, Dr. Cox, would you like to take a Path sure. There's some great research uh, being done in Florida by Florida researchers on this issue. And we're heavily involved in New Hampshire uh, with Dartmouth College and the uh, University of New England uh, looking at this. The, the first answer is, uh, to my surprise and horror, uh, these toxins can be indeed aerosolized and can go quite a ways away from the original waterway. At Dartmouth, uh, Dr. Elijah Stommel, who's a professor of neurology there, and his team calculate that if you live next to a cyanobacterial source, your chances of getting ALS goes up 25-fold. Um, what we don't understand is how much dose is actually being transmitted that way and how much dose is required. Our research now on non-human primates suggests that it's chronicity. In other words, it's multiple impacts of the toxin rather than a single acute exposure that leads to neurodegeneration. So this is an open question. Um, 
can it be airborne? Yes, we know it is airborne. Are the doses that are airborne sufficient enough to trigger illness? That we don't know. Interesting. Anything to add on that, Rob? Well, just uh, when we, you know, we did have patients um, that presented with some of the symptoms I discussed earlier who, who uh, were not immediately adjacent to the water, had not been immediately adjacent to it, but been in the general proximity. Uh, so uh, th that would suggest to me, again, not, not, no, no causal uh, relationship to prove, but uh, it just confirms what Dr. Cox just said. There was some nasal swab testing done in the Stewart region in 2018, and 100% of the people who were swabbed came back with uh, toxins detected from cyanobacteria. So anyhow, I, I know everyone who read news reports of that story was concerned. Okay, we have an, another question here from Becky Harris. Some of the decision makers, CORE, Blue Green Algae Task Force, et cetera, state they need more studies on the effects of cyanobacteria on human health. Are there current studies looking at the damaging effects in Ohio, Florida, wherever that you know of? So I think Becky's looking for some ammunition here to bring to policymakers. Well, well certainly at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, uh, there's research ongoing and Dr. Cox uh, you know, has alluded to that. Um, uh, and I, I would de defer to him beyond that, but I do know the Cleveland Clinic is involved in that research up there. And, uh, and there, I know those folks are quite interested in what's going on down here as well. Um, and Rob, let, let me just add to that. We've had very good research from the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Again, Dr. Eric Pioro, uh, Boulajan, others there are really leading the way. What people in Florida need to realize is this, as you said earlier, Rob, is not a Florida problem. It's a global problem. Uh, our colleagues in France and the Tau Lagoon have found increased ALS in their cyanobacterial contaminated supplies, uh, work in Sweden, uh, work in Spain, our, our researchers uh, in China. I mean, we have a 50 uh, scientist consortium around the world. People can see this research by going onto our website at uh, brainchemistrylabs.org. Um, what we're trying to do, and it's a very interesting line we're walking, Rob, we feel very strongly that we need to be a source of unbiased and politically uncontaminated information for Florida in particular. So we are not accepting any funds from government uh, to do that work. Uh, we started a little initiative called Why Florida, which is a cowboy riding an, an alligator. Uh, some, some great folks in uh, Florida are helping us uh, with, with a little bit of private Donation so that we can stay politically neutral. And Eve, we're, we're not an activist organization. I, I think our best goal is to provide you and Dr. Lord and others with accurate information. But then you guys have got to be the spear carriers in uh, making that a, a public issue in Florida. We just want to stay here in Jackson Hole providing unbiased information. But I have to tell you, uh, we are really concerned. We are really worried. And there isn't a day we don't, I mean, we, we have samples from all over Florida that we analyze on a regular basis in our laboratory. We're culturing them, we're cultivating them, we're learning new things. And what I don't want to see, and then forgive me, Eve, and, and Rob uh, criticized this statement I'm about to make, but I don't want to buy a book 10 or 20 years from now on nexus of neurological disease and have a chapter on Florida, okay? Just like there's going to be a chapter on Fukushima. I do not want Florida turning into Fukushima. And so... It's really important, Eve, now to act. And I'm encouraged by this, but the, the, the illnesses we're talking about take 10 to 20 years to develop. The time to nip them is right now in the bud before it, uh, the pandemic really appears. But Rob, please feel free to criticize that statement. No, not at all. No, in fact, I, I, uh, you reminded me that when we were going through the height of the, the crisis a couple of years ago, um, in, a, in a meeting, I believe, involved the Army Corps and, and our local legislative delegation and others. I stood up and I, you know, in fact, I think it's where I broke out the line that, that, that I did use earlier, which is th that we're looking at long term consequences. And, and I, I can't tell you, I can't prove a causal relationship, but I can. Uh, I, I, we, we should all be able to assume that whatever happens here is not going to be good. Um, but we don't want to wait 20 years to take action to do that. Um, uh, if you, if you, if, you know, I use, I think I made an analogy at the time. I'll do it here with to cigarette smoking. 
uh, many, many years before the Surgeon General came out in the early 1960s and said cigarette smoking causes cancer, the scientists knew that, that cigarette smoking was not good for you and likely did cause cancer. When it was finally determined, basically conclusively determined by science, uh, then, it, then, it, then we took action. Let's not repeat that here. Um, uh, action is needed right now. Let's don't wait 20 years until we have the, the empirical proof and, and, and we say, boy, you know, isn't that terrible? Uh, we have an opportunity to do something about it. And I don't know anyone who suggests that, uh, uh, that, that, that this is a favorable thing for the, for the uh, ecology or for human life. So, Well, and Rob, I really wonder, again, as a Wyoming resident, we're lucky. We have very great water up here in the Yellowstone ecosystem. But why shouldn't people in Florida have great water, too? In other words, why should anybody in Florida have to be exposed to any of this stuff? I mean, there's a precautionary principle here, which is there's things we don't understand as scientists, but what we do know causes us grave concern. And why should people have to worry about this at all? Why not have clean water? Why not have a clean environment? And uh, so we're, we, we stand ready to continue monitoring on a regular basis with our colleagues in Florida uh, what's happening uh, to, to the water there. But if I could just say one thing, Eve, one thing I know in my bones as a scientist is that protecting the environment protects human health. There's no question that there's a link between environmental health and, and human health. And the question that Rob's raised, and again, I'm going to put a plaque up, Rob, in our lab, quoting you, is we're not sure exactly what the percentage of liver cancer is. We're not sure what the percentage of neurodegenerative illness is. I mean, some of these toxins we've collected are actually used as weapons of mass destruction. Okay, I mean, th this is no joke. These are serious things. It's not something to light our hair on fire and run around and be scared at, but it is something that all of us as citizens can speak our voice on and take our own efforts to make sure that we don't discharge nutrients unnecessarily into Lake Okeechobee or into water supplies. And so I'm optimistic, but Rob and Eve, my opinion as a scientist is exactly what Rob said. The time is to act is now. Let's not wait until we understand the full extent of the potential consequences. Right. We at Friends of the Everglades have a long document uh, with links to studies that have been published, and, and we'd be happy to share them with, with anyone who wants to see. Um, if there are policymakers still asking for more evidence, I the cynic in me thinks that's a strategy to kick the can down the road. So we, we have plenty, as you two just described, and, and we do need to act now. I want to get back to a question that flashed on the screen briefly before, because I, I think it's an important way to wind up our conversation. It was about pediatric impacts. I have a 12 year old son. I, I've kept him out of summer camp um, when the water's been bad here in Stewart. Any thoughts on, on how this stuff could affect children in particular? Let me refer to Rob. Well, um, I, first up, I, I don't know of any specific studies that are being done on the pediatric population uh, on this, but uh, it, uh, and again, I, uh, uh, if I was better at math and science, I probably would have been a doctor, but instead I had to be a lawyer because all I could do was talk. Um, but when, what I know about the developing mind of children, uh, and, and uh, I have two grandsons, uh, ages two and four, uh, I will say this, my four-year-old grandson is maybe the most accomplished angler I have ever met at that age, but I admit my bias. Um, but but I, I'm very mindful of that uh, and, and try to keep him away from any exposures because I, uh, I suspect that, 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 that the impact on this, first of all, may be more significant on that developing brain of the child. And second, when you're talking about long-term consequences, they obviously have a longer horizon. Uh, so we need to be worried about that. But I'm not aware of, a, of a, uh, any information from a study that's focused exclusively on pediatric patients. Thank you for that. I first took my son to see the water coming out of the St. Lucie locks when he was four years old. And, and even his four-year-old mind could see that that was not a natural occurrence and that that needed to be stopped. And, and here we are eight years later, still fighting it. Um, you know, this, this is multi-generational work, but, but we can't diminish the urgency of it just because it is long-term. So I really want to 
thank you both for just your insightful comments. It's extremely timely with the lake high now and us looking at potentially a summer of discharges with algae blooms. Public health officials need to be really proactive on this, even as they're burdened by COVID-19. And, and I'd just like to pass it to each of you for a couple of closing remarks. Um, we'll start with you, Rob. Well, first, I want to thank uh, you, Eve, and, and um, uh, the Friends of the Everglade for the opportunity to, to share my thoughts with our audience today. Um, uh, it's been a privilege uh, getting to meet Dr. Cox and getting to know you, and I hopefully we'll be able to continue this relationship and expand on it. Um, I, I, I just I, I encourage, encourage us all to to uh, keep this top of mind, and and uh, it, it's hard to do during a pandemic. And one of the things you know we did touch on earlier was was how this has helped strengthen some relationships. Uh, but there's a tremendous burden on healthcare officials throughout the state of Florida and throughout the, the nation and the world right now. And, and to, uh, to get them, get those people to focus on this issue uh, may be a challenge during this time, uh, but it's critically important to people's health. Uh, and and uh, so I, th that would be my, my ask of, of, of everybody is that we, uh, and we let politicians know, you know, that there are um, uh, so there are people who feel differently about this issue uh, that have other interests. Uh, many of those are very involved politically, very active in making political contributions. And uh, I, my personal opinion is that's had a significant impact over the years in Florida politics. Um, uh, but it's votes that matter and votes that carry the day. And, 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 uh, and, and, and we need to let uh, our elected officials know how important this issue is to each of us. Thank you for that. Dr. Cox, final words from you. Uh, again, we're concerned about the dolphins that were beached in Indian River Lagoon. We're concerned that they may be experiencing some form of dementia. Certainly that would be supported by their neurobiology. They have the Alzheimer's uh, neuropathology and they have the BMA toxin in their brain. So. Looking at these animals, we're getting people now that are telling us about their dogs dying, particularly in the west coast of Florida, uh, domestic animals. So I think it's important for moms and dads to keep their children away from cyanobacterial blooms. This is a pretty easy thing to do. Just don't let them go swim and play in the water. Um, but I, I want to end, Eve, on a, a note of gratitude to you and the Friends of the Everglades. Eve, you've done a tremendous amount in your career as a reporter and now as a leader uh, to, to catalyze a public discussion. And again, I'm optimistic. I think, as Rob's indicated, there's good players on all levels here. I think right now, my focus would be the Corps of Engineers. These are great people. They're smart. They know how to apply science. They know how to do what the public wants to have happen. I think any conversations between citizens and the Corps can only help. And then, Rob, uh, let me just thank you again how heartening to see that the head of the major health organization in that area is really focused on this. And uh, I really, if I were living in Stewart, Rob, I'd really look to you and your team to give quality information and quality treatment. Whatever we can do here in Jackson Hole to assist you and support all of you, we're thrilled to do. And let's see if we can change this uh, trajectory from a bad story to a very positive one. Wouldn't it be great in 20 years from now if there aren't a whole plethora of diseases? Wouldn't it be great if the water's clean and we can go all celebrate uh, the Everglades or walk along with you, Rob, in Indian River Lagoon fishing and seeing the grasses and give a wonderful Florida environment to our children? So let me end it, Eve, on a positive note. I'm optimistic. I'm thrilled to see Congress people and legislators from both parties get involved in this issue. And I'm really hopeful that right now, if we all continue to speak out and encourage uh, uh, our, our leaders, that we can achieve a good good situation in Florida. Certainly that would be my dream, and I'm sure it would be yours as well, Eve. Absolutely. If anyone listening wants to get more involved and help us carry the spear, as Dr. Cox put it, on reforming the Lake Okeechobee Management Plan, visit everglades.org. You can learn more about that. And Again, want to thank you both, Rob, Dr. Cox. This has been a true pleasure. We appreciate your time. Take care. It's been our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.